The sleepers of Ephesus were a group of young men. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِ The word fitya in Arabic. When we say young men in America or in our cultural context, sometimes we use the word youth all the way up until people are 25 or 30. Especially in international contexts where people sometimes stay at home until the age of 30, people think of them as youth. And they don't need to have responsibilities up until 21 or, or 25 until they've graduated college. But Allah refers to fitya when he's talking about teenagers. The young men and women that we sometimes consider not having the ability to make decisions, not having the ability to lead, to make a difference. Like we talked about in other instances where we give them the job of moving the chairs around. Because they have physical strength, but we don't need their brain. The brain is for the 40 and 50 and 60 year olds. In them, fit yet amen. Allah subhanahu wa says that they are a group of young men under the age of 20. And when they did that, they were increased in guidance. What was their story? The sleepers of Ephesus were a group of young men who were among their people like anybody else. It was at the time after Jesus, peace be upon him. And they were taught by a man who was a follower of Jesus and said. And the interesting thing is that the story glorifies, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the story of these sleepers, glorifying them as saints in our eyes. And they were the followers of the Messiah, peace and blessings upon him. And so some, one person might come and say, but if we glorify the followers of Jesus, peace upon them, wouldn't that cause confusion for Muslims? Wouldn't somebody come one day and say, well, maybe it's okay to be Christian or to be Muslim, right? It's okay because as long as they were good like they were good. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to clarify confusion for us and to show us that every prophet, our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he said, my example and the example of the 125,000 prophets before me, in that narration he says, my example and the example of the prophets before me is like a beautiful building that was built. A beautiful building that was built with every brick laid in the building. And people came in and looked at the building and they were in awe. Beautiful building. Except for one place where there was one brick missing. And every time people would come in, they would notice that one brick missing. He said, I, to the prophets before me, I am that brick. I am my message and that brick. This is a connection back to our faith narrative. When we talk about what this message is, what this faith is, it's not one of the religions of the world religions. Our beloved Sassanam came to complete the message sent to every prophet before him. And to complete it by number one, making it comprehensive to be, com to be sufficient for the rest of humanity and for the rest of time. It wasn't specific to one cultural context, like some of the prophets were. It wasn't specific for one time period, like some of the prophets were. It's for all time periods and for all people. And what it also did was correct the misguidance, the veering off that happened for the messages before Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet didn't come with something new. He came to complete the building that God has been building for us since Adam Alayhi Salaam ascended to earth. And so that's why the legacy of the followers of Jesus, peace upon him, that's our legacy. The legacy of Isa salam, of the Messiah, and of his mother, and of the prophets before them. That's our legacy. His disciples who believed in him and carried the word of God alone, of belief in him alone, and that Jesus, peace be upon him, came to bring the children of Israel back to submission to God and the spirit of God alone. That's our legacy. And Muhammad salam, came to complete it. It's not a foreign legacy to this faith. It's not of the West, and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is of the East. This is a fallacy. Fed to the world, 
to bring humanity into differentiation from the path of God. So God brings us back with the sleepers of Ephesus being one of our legacy. But to correct any misguidance that might happen to thinking that whatever a, Chris, a Christian is preaching could be right because they're doing good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the surah first by balancing with what are the fallacies in the creed or in the convictions being propagated by someone who might be claiming following Jesus. And that is when he said, He says that he's giving warning to those who say that God has taken a son. They have no knowledge of such things. There's no proof. There is no evidence. And those who taught them of their forefathers, they have no evidence of such a thing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in another place in the Quran, He says, So this concept of deifying other than God, of holding equality to God, that is far from God's glory. That is far from glorifying God. But that doesn't mean that we divorce ourselves from the legacy of Jesus and his disciples. That is our legacy. And that's why comes right after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies there's no such thing in the creed of God that he has a son or that there's a deity equal to him. Then he says the sleepers of Ephesus were of the miraculous signs of God. And then he tells us the story that Ibn Kathir completes the historical context for us, that at the time the Roman Empire was persecuting the followers of Jesus, peace upon them. And 150 years after Jesus, this was a city, the city of Ephesus is in modern day Jordan, was a, there was a village where all the Christian elders and scholars were killed except for one man was left. And the Emperor Decius, he was killing every one of the teachers of Jesus' message, only worrying about the elder scholars, not caring about the young men and women. So this last scholar, knowing that he was going to be killed as soon as he's found, he decided to do something. Like anybody else of today, he could have said, look, everybody's dead. Let me live my life. I'll worship God. No need to worry about this message propagation stuff. No need to worry about reforming my village to what God loves. I've done my duty. As an elder, he could have said, I've done my duty. But he didn't. Ibn Kathir tells us that what happened is he pulled one young man at a time, between the age of 14 and 17, and started teaching him. He would choose young men who he felt cared about their people cared about society, he saw in them goodness. And they were from all walks of socioeconomic classes. One of them was the cousin of Decius. He was from the home of the emperor. One of them was a sheep herd. That's why they had a dog with them in the cave, when they went to the cave. And he ends up talking separately to six young men, or seven young men. But they don't know each other. And before he could reach more, seven believe in his message, believe that yes, what my, our people are doing of ill treatment of each other, of the rich taking advantage of the poor. And we all know the history of Rome. We know the history of Rome. And we know that the history of Rome didn't change a whole lot even after they accepted the state religion being Christendom, because by that time they changed the religion. They changed it into being something in the church. They changed it into using it for the empire, for the emperor, to continue to take advantage of people. That's why later Karl Marx, as we talked last week, came and said, religion is the opiate of the people. Because the religion was being used to take advantage of the people. That wasn't the message of Isa. The message of Jesus that the elder was teaching these young men was that if you believe in God, if you believe in the last day, you can't allow your people to keep experiencing the social injustice. You can't allow your people to think that all these idols and this emperor is divine. They need to know about God alone. They need to know about the relationship they can have with God personally, and they need to know that justice amongst each other 
is the only way to serve God. So these six young men, seven young men, they believed in his message. And then he was caught. The spies were many. The walls had ears, as they say in some parts of the world. Everybody's a spy. Out of every ten people, there's one spy. No one can trust who they're talking to. That was the place they reached. And there's places on earth today just like that. There's people who spend their life doing nothing but giving, and then their friend sells them out so that they can get a bomb dropped on them for giving to people and making people more aware of goodness. This happens in parts of the world today as we sit here and enjoy our freedoms. So that's what was happening in the Ephesus. So they caught him and they executed him. The last elder to teach the message of Christ. So now, now the six young men are alone. And none of them knows about the other. Because he didn't want to let them know about each other. Because he didn't know if that would get them in further trouble. Until one day, a day similar to our New Year's Eve celebrations, Ibn Kathir says, it was the day that they would feast and get drunk and everybody would enjoy the festivities. Even the emperor himself would visit Ephesus on that day. Everybody's getting drunk. Everybody's going, doing the promiscuous activities that they wait the whole year to do together. And these young men can't take it. They can't take that they're living in such a situation. And they can't take that they would be sitting amongst people doing that. How do we feel when we're sitting with a group of people doing what we know is wrong? We may not engage in it, but how do we feel inside? How do we feel when someone, when we're sitting with four people, and they're eating the flesh of their brother or their sister, as Allah says. They're talking about them, all the ills that they can talk about the person behind their back they're talking about. How do we feel inside? How do we feel for a young man or a young woman? And we, we're told about a party to go to. And we go to the party and we see that there's only one intention at the party. And the only one intention is being facilitated by drugs and alcohol. How do we feel inside? We may not drink. Oh, I don't drink because I'm listening. How do we feel sitting amongst the people? They felt bad. So they left. Each one of them separately left the situation. And to get out of the festivities, everywhere was festivities, everywhere people are getting drunk, even their parents and their relatives. So each one of them walks out of the village and gets to the closest oasis to the village. And they start finding each other at that closest oasis. And they sit silent, each of them knowing that these guys must be here for a similar reason to me but each of them afraid to talk to the other. Maybe he's a spy. Maybe he's a spy. That's how much distrust was living amongst them. And you all know what I'm talking about. Some of you have lived it. Some of you came to the States because you couldn't take it anymore. The walls have ears. And then one of them decides, I can't take it anymore. I have to say something. So he says, by God, nothing brought me out of the city except what brought you out of the city. And let us speak to each other and make a pact that no one will give the other up. So they start talking to one another. And they realize that each of them has the same backstory. That it's the elder man, the one whom we don't know his name, and we don't know their name. And Allah doesn't even mention him for us in the Quran. He's mentioned in the prophetic traditions. But he decided that he's not going to relent. And he brings them together. He did his part by relaying what he could. And then he was killed. So God completes it for him. Brings them together. Now they're not just a group of young men who believe and don't want what their people are doing. Now they're a group that can do something about it. 